special panel discussion on universal health coverage. As the head of the 27 United Nations the agencies that have the privilege of working in India, I'm particularly delighted that you've all come to be part of this discussion. I would like to start by congratulating the United Nations task team on universal health coverage, which is led by Dr. Nata and the World Health Organization. Today, we're focusing on universal health coverage. The United Nations as a system gives the highest priority to universal health coverage as a way of ensuring that all people have access to and use health services without financial hardship. You may be aware that in December 2012, the General Assembly adopted a resolution that urged governments to move towards universal coverage. Since then, more than 70 governments around the world have asked the United Nations for technical and policy support to help achieve universal coverage. We wish to acknowledge as the UN, and we do so with appreciation, the commitment of the government of India to improve health services. And we welcome and acknowledge the very positive steps which have been taken by the government, including national flagship schemes focused on improving access to and the quality of health care in both rural and urban areas. And we also acknowledge with appreciation the establishment several years ago by the Planning Commission of a high-level expert group on universal health coverage, which was responsible for developing a framework for providing easily accessible and affordable health care. As I think we all know, the issues around universal health coverage are not easy. Many of them are complicated, and all of them require technical expertise to solve. The UN's task team under Dr. Nata's leadership has prepared an expert briefing note, which is in your packages, that summarizes key aspects of the debate. The UN is particularly concerned about three key things. First, how do you increase access to health services? Second, how we increase access to medicines. And third, how we increase the financing that's available for health care. These three questions go right to the heart of the matter. As I think we are all aware, government spending on health care in India is one of the lowest in the world. However, personal out-of-pocket spending on health care is one of the highest. Government spending, one of the lowest in the world. Out-of-pocket, personal expenditure on health care, one of the highest. What this means is that more people are paying for health care out of their meager household budgets than anywhere else in the world. Worse, experts estimate that nearly 14 million people in India have been pushed back across the poverty line because of a catastrophic illness in a family. The aim of today's panel discussion is to discuss the many complex issues that are related to universal coverage, and it's my privilege to welcome a panel of experts who have decades of experience on health coverage. Allow me to first welcome Dr. Natha Manavi, the WHO representative of India, who's going to share WHO's position on universal health coverage. We are equally delighted to welcome Professor Indrani Gupta, the head of the Health Policy Research Unit of the Institute of Economic Growth, which is India's leading academic institution in the field of economic and social development. We also have the benefit of three experts from the World Health Organization who will be sharing country examples from the regions they are working in. Allow me to welcome Dr. Vivian Lee, the Director of Health Sector Development in WHO's Western Pacific Regional Office. Allow us to welcome Dr. Rudiger Kresh, the Director of the Office of Health Systems and Innovation in WHO Geneva. Allow us also to welcome Dr. Alaka Singh, the Regional Advisor on Health Economics and Health Planning in WHO's Southeast Asia Regional Office. And also to welcome Dr. Antonio Duran, the advisor in WHO's country office in India, who will be moderating the discussion. I would now like to invite my friend and colleague, Dr. Nata, to deliver the presentation. And 
as Dr. Nanta is taking her place at the podium, we were speaking right before the presentation began about the webcast. Uh, this panel discussion is being webcast live to universities and institutions, not only all over India, but we're also sharing it through the UN's network locally. So we hope that there will be literally millions of people who will be part of the discussion today. Well, I'd like to join our resident coordinator in welcoming all of you here. And I know that many of you are quite involved in the work around universal health coverage. So perhaps uh, there is not much news that you are going to hear, but I think it's a good opportunity to uh, once again put those issues together under one a uh, single framework, raise them, and share the experiences of handling some of those challenges that we as WHO could bring forward and share as a whole UN community with you. So what really is universal health coverage? There are, of course, scientific definitions of that. There are reports in which we are defining that. There are definitions for UN, but there are also definitions for the India specific, but all of it builds around having for all people, and this is a very critical aspect of universality, that all people should have access to the effective quality services which are ranging from promoting preventive, curative, rehabilitative, and palliative services. And it includes all sorts of services. It includes radiological, laboratory. So it is really all-encompassing uh, concept and that they get the services when they need and that they do not have to suffer financial hardship when they have to pay for those services. So this is really the core of this uh, concept as far as WHO is concerned. And um, our Director General, Dr. Margaret Chan, has always been saying, since we have really started to work on this concept in a very systematic manner, that it is really the most powerful concept that public health can offer these days. So it can give solution to many things across all diseases, across the prevention, across the service delivery, across the quality challenges, and many other areas. So here is some example that within universal health coverage, we do not talk anymore about communicable diseases or non-communicable diseases, but we talk about whole range of services, which sometimes need to be provided to the same person who may have not one, but several diseases that need to be addressed, and therefore, when the person has interaction with the health system, that person should be having possibility and access to all the services that he or she may require. The intervention area uh, areas go, as I said, uh, across all the conditions. But then the way of looking at the progress achieved in handling these challenges is really to look about the tracer indicators. And I will be not talking too much about the measurement, but these are some of the examples where you, for example, on antiretroviral, um, on HIV AIDS area, you may measure access to antiretroviral therapy, which is a life-saving intervention. And therefore, it is extremely important, even though if it is not specifically the uh, you know, epidemiological issue that we are touching upon. We are intervening here through the uh, management, procurement, supply, logistics, and other interventions. And that is also a very clear characteristic of universal health coverage, that it brings together all sorts of professionals, health professionals, management professionals, who need to come together in the multidisciplinary teams in an integrated manner and pull together all the resources uh, to serve the needs of entire population. So other components of the universal health coverage uh, are related very much to the financial protection. We have just heard from our resident coordinator that uh, the extraordinarily high level of out-of-pocket expenditure in India is something which is really a very serious barrier to the access to the needed services. It also involves, the concept involves also um, sufficient staffing of sufficient quality, sufficient technology, availability of necessary infrastructure, but also tools and mechanisms to govern the whole complexity of the universal health coverage agenda. That requires special regulatory and institutional arrangements and uh, many other interventions that we are talking about. This is a very famous cube 
which is included in WHO's 2010 report on the universal health coverage. And it really talks about three dimensions. Who should be covered? Who are those people? What kind of needs they have? What services do they require? And what services government at particular stage can afford and manage to cover for all those people or for increasing number of those people? And how to reduce really out-of-pocket expenditure that is in ideal circumstances that all those costs should be paid from the um, some one big pool from the public money but at the moment we are talking about actually reversing the trend if we can get to have uh, say achieved 80 percent of the public expenditure on health out of all expenditure that is going to be a very important goal to achieve there are many wishes we have, and populations, obviously, in every country want to be covered from all sorts of services. I think there's a one, this is a very important distinction that WHO is making. Universal health coverage is not a goal that needs to be achieved by covering every service and every need of every person in every country. This cannot be afforded even by the most affluent countries in the world. We are talking about progressive, incremental coverage, thereby universal health coverage becomes not a goal, but the direction in which we are moving. And therefore, every country with no excuses can and should be engaged in achieving higher level of universality, higher level of the coverage of by those services. But if we look at, for example, diseases like diabetes, I, I'll start from the bottom of this slide. One thing is that you can talk about effective quality of care for diabetic patients during, for example, when they are having coma. But you can also be talking about early diagnosis of diabetes, which is not a curative, but uh, maybe pre-curative service, sort of. Then you are going to be talking about health promotion and prevention services where you can engage upstream in talking to the patients about the uh, healthy eating habits, sugar-free foods, and Finally, empowerment and gender equity. So there are levels of interventions here we are talking about. And we are not just talking about provision of curative services. This is one of the myths about universal health coverage. It is not about treatment and care. It's also about health promotion, disease prevention, rehabilitation. It is all that which is involved in this concept. And there are plenty of disease-specific examples on that. So we need to demystify this myth. It can engage in multi-sectorial efforts. It can deal with even social determinants of universal health coverage, which we are actually discussing with colleagues who are uh, in India to, to develop WHO standpoint on in involving social determinants into the concept of universal health coverage. So what we are really looking at is how do we get more money to health? How do we increase public expenditure on health? Because there is a sufficient evidence that those countries who are spending more public resources on health achieve that populations in these countries spend less out of pocket, which actually protects people from experiencing catastrophic expenditures on health. But we also have to look at efficiency and equity and quality of the services which they are uh, receiving. And I want to especially emphasize in the context of India issue of equity, which we have uh, widely dealt with in WHO's country cooperation strategy with the government of India, where among three priority areas that we have agreed to collaborate in the uh, years to come, uh, one is very clearly promoting access to and utilization of those efficiently networked services of sustainable quality for the entire population. That is, in other words, universal health coverage. Now, why is it important for India to tackle this issue? India has lived without universal health coverage for all the years behind. Well, because, first of all, the epidemiological agenda of the country and the changing reality is demanding this because we are facing the threats of non-communicable diseases. We are successful in some disease eradication. Polio has been one major success, but that will not solve the health problems of the country, and it will not make population healthier unless we are looking at it from the lens of universality. India is repositioning as powerhouse. It needs to sustain its economic progress and achievement through healthy population. That is health and wealth connectivity, we all know, and we 
uh, do not question that. But it is also important to deal with this because India has massive amount, some very successful, some less successful, vertical interventions which government has been implemented at national level, at state level. So those variety of schemes that are very well known and provide coverage to different parts of the population from different services, they are no longer as effective as they are expected to be. So there is now massive look at the evaluation of those schemes. There is a clear commitment which is saying in 12 five year plan that integration should happen and revision of all these services should happen because these services do not position India favorably in the global landscape. If you look at the basic key health indicators such as infant mortality, life expectancy, under five mortality, measles coverage, India does not have good standpoint even in the BRICS context countries, but also in the context of its neighboring countries. There are challenges bigger than we want to see in India. We are also looking at the public expenditure. I'm just illustrating what uh, Liz uh, Grande has mentioned in her welcome speech, that India really spends much less per capita than the others. It spends much less as a total proportion of its GDP. So we really need to look at that. 30% of all health expenditure to be covered by public purse is not enough. We, there is an evidence for that. Look where India stands on those bulk graph. It is about public expenditure on health. India is lagging in a very uh, low part of this graph, but also on the out-of-pocket expenditure, India is on the top of the graph. So that shows us that something needs to be done to change that. But that cannot be just changed by putting more money in the system. We need to put more money, but we need to create a system which is able to absorb this money efficiently and provide services of the quality with which is effective enough to tackle those health problems. This is another, again, picture comparative figures for uh, with the neighboring countries on the same issue. We have also heard that there are, why did UN resident coordinator mention that we are very much looking in reducing expenditure on medicines? Because this expenditure is just too high and all people who need health care, they go and they have to buy, even if they are hospitalized, very often they have to go and uh, buy uh, pharmaceuticals which are required for their treatment separately from the pharmacist. So in any case, this is huge. It is a huge burden and it is pushing people into poverty in numbers which are translated in millions. If you compare 1993-94 to 2004 uh, and five, a decade of difference brought 26 million who were falling in poverty then into 39 million who are falling in poverty as by figures of 2004 and 5. So the number of people with increasing cost of therapies with new technologies coming up is simply increasing disproportionately and falling into poverty with a high uh, speed. Now if we look at this kind of, we try to map, you don't need to look at all those things, but what it shows is that there are too many schemes which cover some insurance schemes, they cover up to 25% of the population currently, which is some prepaid uh, contributory uh, schemes, but, um, but not more than that. So majority of population is not covered by all those schemes. But there is some reasonable coverage with both primary and uh, secondary and tertiary care services. But if you look at those complexity of those schemes and lack of clarity which scheme covers what, you would agree that poor people cannot navigate in this scheme. They wouldn't be able to go and obtain the services they need because there are just too many schemes, too many involvement, too many mechanisms of benefiting from those services, too unclear um, packages. So that there is a clear need to streamline those arrangements so that uh, people can benefit from the services available for them. Um, if you look at some of the examples, we have picked Haryana here, and you look at this figure which shows that some of services which are critical and really basic services, such as immunization, for example, or institutional delivery on postnatal care, there is a very low utilization of those services for a variety of reasons amongst those, not just health system issues, but also governance issues and also social 
determinants, inequities issues, and many other issues which need to be looked at disaggregated level to understand the complexity of the problem. Um, this is within each state. I mean, there are differences between states. Everybody knows that on everything. But if you look even within states, the districts, the range of the differences is just, just too big. And in that, with that level of inequity, um, India cannot really guarantee uh, productivity of its people, quality of life for the people, and the development in, the, uh, in, in parallel to the economic growth of this country. So there are many context-specific issues which we need to take into consideration. There are too many variables that need to be addressed. And there is a great need to have a robust, reliable, integrated information system whereby one can easily collect this data, analyze them, and tailor interventions on the basis of very context-specific uh, analysis as to what needs to be done and how we should move on that. And that is a precondition to address inequities which we are facing in access to healthcare in India. So there are many data sources which are currently available, but they are not uh, put together in an effective manner. Um, so the policy, I mean, the WHO report has been very clear on one statement. It is political will rather than economic development or the national wealth, which is a critical prerequisite for any government to move towards universal health coverage. Now, India has put forward uh, itself at all levels and declared that universal health coverage is something which is a commitment for decades to come. However, uh, from the time of this declaration till now, we all agree that we have seen maybe uh, some vertical approaches to piloting some of the universal health coverage schemes in India, but we have not seen a coordinated, comprehensive, holistic approach which would take into consideration state situation, national level situation, pull together all the strategies and develop practical operational roadmap to move ahead in a coordinated manner. So what we are saying here that it's easier, of course, for me to stand here and talk about this than to the governments at any level to implement this. But that's where we are there to kind of contribute to this thinking, this development. And we are very optimistic that this is an agenda item which can move forward. There are lots of provision. There are a lot of people who are thinking and doing those, this work. And we believe it is a very feasible option for India. It will make a profound difference to health of Indian population in the years to come. There is necessary knowledge, necessary research capacity, necessary implementation and management skills which exist in the system. All we need is a strong political will to pull together all these different strings and move in a comprehensive manner. Thank you very much for your attention. We would now like to uh, ask Professor Indrani Gupta from the Institute of Economic Growth to share her reflections. Thank you, and I'm uh, really grateful to the UN and the WHO for inviting me to this August gathering. Um, I will uh, just present my own views. I'm not speaking on behalf of the Indian government. Uh, how are we doing in India on the UHC front? Well, we are almost at the end of the MDG era, and we need to think of new approaches uh, post-MDG. Um, how have we, have we done well? Uh, how have we done on the MDG goals? We know that India hasn't been actually able to meet all the MDG health goals, and uh, certainly not the child and maternal health goals, um, and we have a long way to go. There are huge disparities across states between rural and urban areas, between various socioeconomic groups, and between households. There are many reasons for poor health. I mean, this is uh, universal health coverage is only one such. But one reason continues to be the lack of access to available and quality health care. Therefore, universal health coverage can be seen as a tool to ensure that all the people who need health care services get them without financial hardships, as Dr. Minabdi has already pointed out. Now, there are three overlapping ways of thinking about universal health coverage. One is the health equity approach, where you deal with differences that are unnecessary and avoidable, and also unjust and unfair uh, as well. 
there's a human rights approach, which uh, really tells you that uh, you know, it's a, about distributive justice. And the human rights approach makes it all the more imperative that we move towards equity in uh, healthcare. And there's a social determinants of health approach, an approach which I think has been somehow pushed to the back burner, but needs to be brought, brought forward again. Because the reason why we haven't met all the MDG health goals is not only because of universal health coverage, but also because of nutrition, because of hunger, because of many other things like poverty, etc. So we do need to think of uh, the uh, social determinants of health, where it emphasizes the circumstances in which people are born, grow up, live, and work. And these circumstances are, in turn, uh, shaped by economic and political and other policies. Uh, and inequities can be addressed to a large extent if we uh, set those right first that, that are easy to tackle. Therefore, the universal health coverage approach takes on a different meaning in the context of SDH and human rights and health equity approaches. So USC can actually do exactly that. And India is therefore quite uh, in the, on the right direction. It has appointed the HLEG a while ago. The Planning Commission did so. And it has been very recently thinking of uh, uh, essential health package for, for the country with 20 indicators, as some of you may know. Uh, a while ago, we also had the National Commission on Macroeconomics and Health, where there was a lot of discussion and debate around uh, what an essential health package might comprise. Now, basically, the country is dealing with highly iniquitous health outcomes. Uh, I don't have to go over this again. We have just seen how iniquitous health outcomes are. Uh, there's, there are also inequities ex uh, to access in health services and in health financing as well. And the main problems, to sum up uh, the previous discussion, continues to be the high out-of-pocket expenditures and lack of available and accessible quality health services. Now, if we had a functional health system, maybe we didn't have to think of universal health coverage as a, as a separate tool. But the truth is that we don't really have a functional health system in India. Now, thinking of UHC for a second, there are four ingredients that um, go into improved access for a successful UHC. One is financing from government revenues, and come back to that point in a while. Removal of financial barriers like user fees. Ensuring large risk pools, and I'll again return to the point, and compulsory prepayments. And the kind of cross-cutting issue is health system strengthening. Where is India in all this? Take the resources first. We have just heard that we spend only 1% of our GDP on, uh, on health. And most of the expenditures, uh, for those of you who are not aware, is, is coming from the states. Uh, so central government spends much less than the state governments in, in, its, in the total health expenditure that is publicly financed. Um, we need additional resources to run any new UHC scheme, of course, so there would be the recurrent costs. And we have been doing some calculations uh, in, in my institute on how much it would cost to run a UHC program by looking at per unit costing. We need uh, resources to uh, set up the new system for administrative costs, for m &E, for operational research. So the resource requirements are huge, but more than that, we have huge gaps currently, as the government data shows, in infrastructure and personal requirements. And we are really not operating at the population norms that we have set up for ourselves. To even bridge those gaps, we need huge amounts of money. So HSS has to precede any thoughts on universal health coverage, and, and uh, otherwise we cannot really run uh, a good uh, universal health coverage program. Think about user fees. Of course, we need to abolish all user fees. But currently, three-fourths of the total expenditure is uh, out of pocket, and much of it is in the private sector with, with user fees. Uh, private sector is unregulated and growing. And uh, we also depend on the private sector. The government also depends on the private sector for many of its health schemes. So we need to take a position on how we deal with the pri private sector in our new approach to uh, universal health coverage. Risk pools. We have a highly fragmented health coverage system. Uh, we have health coverage for the central government employees, for the railway workers, for the defense. We have the RSBY there. We have the ESIS. 
this is a really inefficient system of running any health coverage program. So they, we have different schemes for the entire country and the, and the government in all spends about less than 10% on health coverage and it spends it on a small percentage of the population. So there are huge inequities in the current ways the government is spending on health coverage, which we must address. Um, then there are different ministries and departments running different schemes and we need to think of how we want to move beyond that and how do we want to cons consolidate. Then there is the whole issue of prepayment. If we have to run a UHC with an essential health package for all, the government has to subsidize in a big way those who cannot pay. And we need uh, uh, funds for, the, uh, for them and it has to probably come from general tax revenues or other tax revenues like earmark taxes, but we need to take a decision on that as well. Finally, something I didn't flag then is the purchase of services. The government has to think of how it can pay for the uh, provi providers, how it purchases services from the providers to run the UHC system. So the current system is really a scheme-based system. And for universal health coverage, we need a systems approach, which I think at this point is lacking even in, its, uh, you know, uh, in the debates that we are having in, in the country. Um, we need major rethinking around universal health coverage. Um, the government has drawn up a very neat list of 20 uh, indicators uh, that might go into an you know, uh, essential health package. Uh, and, and these are very comprehensive. They cover maternal and child health, NCDs, communicable diseases, vector-borne diseases, which is a big thing, and, and preventive and promotive services, because we don't not only want to give curative care, we want to prevent diseases as well. So there has to be an equal emphasis on preventive, promotive, and, and curative. But uh, have we really planned around universal health coverage? The states have been asked to pilot some of these uh, uh, schemes, and it's not really clear, at least to us, um, what the government really means uh, when it says pilot uh, uh, the, uh, the essential health package. So what I'm saying is that we really need a lot of rethinking. We need to step back, take a deep breath, uh, take time to do this, because if we can only do it right once, uh, we cannot make mistakes because mistakes are going to be very costly uh, in a system which is uh, you know, the way it is. Raising resources, it is not only about uh, whether we have fiscal space, our other analysis that uh, you see here sponsored shows that the government of India does have this fiscal space to raise resources. It's not as though we don't. Um, you may not want to have earmark taxes, but we have general revenues that can go into universal health coverage and reach um, a quantum jump. Some of the calculations we have been doing, even in, on another piece of work that we're doing, is that the recurrent cost, and I don't want to be quoted on these numbers, but our back of the envelope calculation shows that the recurrent cost of running an essential health package could be anywhere between 2 to 6% of the GDP. This is just a recurrent cost, and we are not talking about health systems strengthening, and filling up the personnel and the uh, infrastructure gaps. So we are really talking about a huge jump in resources, but it's more than that. There has been no public finance planning at all around universal health coverage in India. What does that mean? We have not figured out who is getting what and for uh, which services. This is a and a planning exercise that is to precede any discussion of universal health coverage. And that really hasn't happened, at least not to, my, to the best of my knowledge. And that uh, has to happen. And why? Because if you already have a fragmented system of coverage, you need to take a decision about those fragments before you can move on to a bigger system. What do we do with the CGHS? What do we do with the railways? Where does ESIS fit in? What happens to RSPY? What happens to the private sector? None of these decisions have been discussed and debated in India. If we are going to plonk a new system down on the current system, I don't think that's the right way at all. Um, at the end of it, we have to think of um, the uh, health system as a whole. Now, if we could strengthen the health system by uh, rectifying all the gaps, and believe me, the gaps are huge in some of the states, what we don't have by way of personnel, medical staff, nurses, and also infrastructure. We really haven't really uh, met those norms that we, have, we had laid, laid down for, for ourselves. Uh, we probably would be moving towards 
universalizing access in any case. So whether we really need to think of universal health coverage as one separate tool or do it via health system strengthening is again another debate that we haven't really uh, discussed much in, uh, in, in India. Um, as Dr. Minab just said, a uh, lot of the decisions are really political. Uh, consolidating the current fragmented tools is a political decision because those people who are benefiting from those uh, systems are probably going to resist them as well. So can we really merge the CGHS with the railways, with the defense, with the other things and, and create one pool? And very curiously, the public finance aspect is the other side of the consolidation, right? I mean, if you don't really know how much you're spending on all this, how do you calculate how much you need? And this is something that maybe I don't have a good understanding, but I haven't figured it out. So you really need to do that exercise around public finance. Um, an important question is that when the states have, are basically doing all the actions, the states are investing resources more than the central government, they're running their health systems, uh, they are going to be the real players. Do we really need one essential health package for the entire country or do we really have do we really need to uh, leave, leave it to the states to come up with their uh, package our approach has been and it's it's going to be articulated publicly very soon is that maybe we should have one comprehensive list but the states should look at their own disease burden their own infrastructural requirements and their own health financing situations to really decide what they want to emphasize on in their disease package, in their essential health package. So if Arunachal Pradesh is dealing with high malaria burden and vector-borne diseases, then it should, be, should have the independence to put more emphasis on that. And if Kerala has more NCDs uh, rather than maternal and child health, then that is where the emphasis should be. So at the end of it, it is not clear whether the central government has to be the real player or the state governments have to be uh, the, the real players. And what is the division of responsibility between the center and the states in terms of planning, in terms of administration, in terms of financing? This exercise has not taken place in India. To, uh, and, and I think we really need to step back. HLEG has been very good. So has been this 20 points program of, of the essential health package. But I think we need to do much more than that. One uh, theme that I, as a researcher, return to again and again is that the Indian government or the Ministry of Health needs to set up a research wing, either within its own premises or uh, through a coalition of researchers. I don't know how it might want to do it, where evidence-based uh, research can influence policy making. And that is the other big lacuna right now in this whole UHC debate. Many countries have a very close relationship with, uh, between researchers and policy makers, so that course correction is very easy for them to do. Um, we, we have actually not done that yet. So to, to jump and, and ask states to, uh, to start uh, uh, piloting uh, schemes is, I think, a little premature. Uh, a lot more homework needs to be done and um, we really need to step back and think about a more meticulous way of planning this whole universal health coverage approach. Thank you. Now it works. The lines move on. Thank you, Rani. Um, it's a privilege to be here moderating this panel with um, these uh, professionals of this stature. And, and we have a set of panelists that I would like to introduce to you from left to right, from right to left, sorry. There we have Alaka Singh, who's an economist with 15 years of work experience in the area of health and development. She's the regional advisor in health economics in the Department of Health System Development 
in the Seattle region, and she's responsible for universal coverage in, uh, in this part of the world, and she's also contributing to the WHO's normative work in this technical area. She has worked previously with WHO in her quarters, and also with the World Bank, with, with uh, any other, several other institutions, including the Faculty of Economics in, in Cambridge in the UK. Thank you very much for participating. Then we have Dr. Vivian Lin, who is the director of the health sector development of the World Health Organization in the Western Pacific region. She is responsible for, for this division um, and provides support to countries as well and, and, and in a wide range of health system issues, including universal coverage, healthcare financing, human resources, information system, and health system research, pharmaceuticals, laboratory <laughs> services, and many others. She's also in charge of cross-cutting issues in human rights and gender, and as part of the health challenges. She has more than 30 years' experience in public health, in program development, in planning and research. She has been a professor at public health at La Trobe University in Melbourne, and has published a number of books in Australia and in China, and has worked as a consultant in several jurisdictions for the bank, for the UK Department of International Development, USAID, WHO, etc. She has, she has a doctorate in public health from Berkeley and then an MPH from Berkeley and a BA from Yale. Welcome and thanks very much. And here to my left, I have the honor to introduce you to Dr. Rudiger Kretsch from Germany. He's the director of the Office of the Assistant Director General in Health Systems and Innovation at the World Health Organization in Geneva. He follows up with directors and program leads on decisions by the Assistant General Director related to the scope of the HIS clusters and acts on, be on her behalf in her absence and represents her in her duties in meetings uh, when and assigned by her. The Director also facilitates coordination and coherence between the work streams of HIS and other clusters in the headquarters of the WHO. He was uh, from, 19, from 2009 to, to to, uh, 2012, the director of the Department of Ethics and Social Determinants of Health, the director of the Department of Ethics, Equity, Trade, and Human Rights of the World Health Organization in Geneva, and he was also responsible in that capacity for the work on the social determinants of health. Before that, he was working for GIZ, the German International Cooperation, on social protection for six years, from 2003 to 2009, in headquarters near Frankfurt, and also he has worked in India. He has also held various management positions in the regional office of Europe, in the health um, systems field, in health policies, health promotion, etc. He studied economic science, educational sciences, medicine and public health, and holds a doctoral degree in public health. So it's obvious that we have a, a very, very distinguished panel with a lot of qualification. Thank you very much for participating, Rudiger. Now, I'd like to ask you a few questions, two, three, four, depends on the time, and then open the floor for you to participate. And the first question in the context of what we're saying, starting from Alaka, please. But I would also like you, all, of it, all of you to address this. Is there any example in the region where you work from which India can draw lessons, clear lessons, like the do's and don'ts? What are the lessons learned because if, if Indrani has said something clear, and Dr. Menabde as well, is that proclaiming that you have it done is just the beginning. The real work comes later and that you have to do it. What are the experiences in, in, this, in this countries, in this region, or in your region, that are relevant for India? And at what level are they particularly relevant? Please. Thank you, and hello, everybody. Um, I'll start with answering that question with, with, with an aspect that I know is very close to Indranvi's heart, which is research. As she mentioned, we need to do a lot of work in terms of building evidence specific to our problems. And I'll use the example throughout of Thailand, which is the country in our region, Southeast Asia region, that has been acknowledged as achieving universal health coverage. And let's remember, it did so when it was still a low to middle income country. So we are not looking at, at economic growth really to push universal health coverage. Um, Thailand in 2001, when it launched this universal health coverage uh, in a big way, had really based 
uh, its, its progress on a lot of evidence building. Um, there was, of course, a lot of groundwork, which included an ex excellent network of primary healthcare services. This changing of gear from scheme-based to a national strategy was very important. To 2001, there were, there were smaller schemes that targeted specific service delivery to specific pockets of the population. But really to change gears away from fragmentation, as is the case in India today, to really a national effort under the universal health care coverage. Again, not calling it a scheme, even though Thailand has three schemes, and today they are facing problems in terms of merging them. Um, looking at financing for India as well, really coming from government resources. That's really, really critical. Today, Thailand has less than 3% that really is contributory. Or it has a very comprehensive health package, but the funding is coming from committed government resources. Um, again, once we've collected the, the, the resources, we've pooled them, we have to be very strategic about what is purchased and from whom. Again, Thailand has been very careful about bringing in its private sector, um, and it's not as though it's not using its private sector, it is using its private sector, but really to be very, very closely regulated, particularly in terms of the, private, pri the provider payment mechanisms. They've moved from fee-for-service, which really has all sorts of disincentives, including um, um, the impact on costs, to moving towards capitation and global budgets. So really not just raising adequate resources for health, but also making sure that how we purchase is effective. So a lot of lessons learned there for India. Um, and again, most importantly, it was done when Thailand was still a low to middle income country. Um, I do want to uh, also highlight what WR said about political will. 2001, a key, a key political um, message from the new prime minister was universal health coverage. I think that was the big, big push in 2001 that allowed Thailand essentially in the next five years to be declared as having achieved universal health coverage. So really what binds the effort together is that political will, is that push. Let me perhaps draw some lessons from China, given comfortability in terms of the population, the complexity of the countries. Um, and BRICS or Chindia, depending on how people <laughs> like to talk about it. Um, I think what's interesting about the Chinese experience is, in fact, it went from an almost free, good quality, equitable health system to a total collapse where more than 80% of the population was basically paying out of pocket in a fee-for-service system. And major reforms that happened in 2009, um, so that in 2013, the Chinese was reporting near universal health coverage in terms of financial uh, coverage. So that's an interesting journey. And again, I will reinforce some of the key messages. The research has been very important. Research from institutions within China basis for much advocacy and experimental research to test different ways in which you can provide better health care. A second aspect is actually the way donors have become a very, very strong partner. So that projects in terms of just being pilots that then disappear, evaluated policy dialogues, engagement with government, taking them to scale. The problem is that some of this tends to be quite piecemeal when it, it's done. So we really took a political will to try and bring this together in a comprehensive system-wide approach. But where does the political will come from? It doesn't just drop from the sky. So the crisis of SARS certainly pointed to a very, very fragile health system. The government invested money at the time and for the first time started to think about intergovernmental financial transfers rather than just leaving it to the provinces. But the community complaint became also very important. So this is the question of social and political stability and the government really need to think 
just beyond economic growth and really be able to respond to the, the complaints um, in the community. So I think these were some of the really, really important forces that came together, the evidence base, the practical experience, the crisis that allowed then the political decision making because there was no choice but to actually do it and then to do it in a, in a comprehensive fashion rather than a piecemeal fashion. Vivian, as you were talking about China, um, let me talk about Brazil. It's mm. bricks. Um, in, in Brazil, uh, the entry point was not so much security or economic growth, as uh, Alaka mentioned, but it was very much the social justice agenda, human rights, very much on their agenda. And so therefore, um, the issue they started with was to put it into their constitution. Right, so you were talking about political will, but then there's also a very strong legal basis for that. Now, Brazil is anything but an equal society, but the thrive for more equity is definitely there. And therefore, um, to uh, enshrine the right to health care um, and universal health coverage is a big step forward. Now, the second second thing then perhaps is that if, if you're um, starting with um, a sort of universal health coverage, where do you start? Um, and uh, another example from uh, countries is that then they said, oh, that's interesting. Now, um, health insurance, uh, wonderful. Let's start with the civil service. And then let's see how it triggers down. And what we see is it doesn't really work like this. So what you want to have in, in a country is a solidarity mechanism where the rich pay for the poor, the healthy pay for the unhealthy, and the young pay for the old. So once you have that in place, then you can still, and I think Indrani, I, I, that was perfect, your intervention. Thank you so much for it, because you said all the right things. Now, the question is, what sort of package do you then draw? And it needs to be a package that keeps us going, keeps us all more or less healthy. Now, all of us here, we're sort of elites, right? I guess. We're all in the richer parts of societies. We all come from, you know, the richer parts of, I guess, the societal context where we are from. Um, and what we want to ensure is that there's appropriate service for all. And then still, we can buy our, what we would call hotel services, that perhaps we're not in a, in a room with 20 other people. Uh, but the diagnostics, they should be the same. If I'm now seen as a, with a, from a normal doctor, or if I'm then seen by the chief uh, surgeon, that's a different matter again. And maybe I can pay for that. But I shouldn't be paying, and there you're absolutely right, I shouldn't be paying for the normal services. And let's be clear here. We in the health system, we're part currently of the problem. We're not part of the solution so far. And that's why we need to work on universal health coverage. We throw 100 million people into poverty every year because of their health expenditure. 100 million. So if we want to achieve the MDGs and if we want to look at the at the sustainable development goals, we cannot do this if we're not having universal health coverage. And I think that's the main message we want to, to, uh, to, to give um, to the discussion also that we're having now in New York as we speak. The open-ended working group is, is having their meetings as well, but we need, really need to be aligned in the UN system on universal health coverage. Thank you, Rudiger. Madam Resident Coordinator, Dolivar, do you want to say anything, please? I have never thought that it made sense when somebody's poor to charge them for health care when they're sick. I think there's a fundamental moral issue that goes with that proposition. 
and to the degree that the United Nations system has recognized that that is an unacceptable proposition for any country and adopted in December 2012 a resolution which said that the answer to that fundamentally moral problem is universal primary health coverage. All the countries in the world should be a part of it. I think it is surprising when you look at India's record in its progressive legislation, its commitment to progressive social policy that it lags so far behind on this of all issues. I think that raises an important question for activists in India and for policymakers about why they haven't managed to crack this. You've got right to food, right to education, you've got right to information. Not many countries in the world have that. And yet on this question, which goes right to the heart of the social fabric, progress has been disappointing. Um, I'd like to reflect on the human rights dimension of that because it is not very a long time that we have started to talk about access to health services as a human right issue. We have been talking about health as a human right issue more extensively, but and it has become very explicit now that access to those services is also a human rights issue. Even US government with all its reforms came from the human rights dimension. So I think that needs to be going much deeper in the understanding of the Indian government also. Although, of course, in the discussion for us, this is well understood. But then when it comes to some independent review of human rights uh, progress we have just been doing within the UN team, we have seen that easy recommendations from the human rights perspective that are given by other governments to India, they are accepted. And it's advisory uh, kind of part. But then when it comes to hard stuff, where you really have to do some serious changes in the system, then those are not accepted. And we were looking at these statistics and say, well, if you don't really touch the uh, bull in the horn, then it will not really give you the change that you need. So I think that is where we talk about political will. It's not necess It's a hard work in Drani, but it's not a rocket science. You have all the intellectual capacity in this country to sit around the table, bring all the stakeholders, and get moving on this agenda. The other thing which I really want to emphasize, the private sector service provision in India. We know indeed that not only out-of-pocket expenditure, but also service provision is largely and predominantly happening from the private sector. I'm not talking about five stars, I'm talking about uh, unqualified providers, all sorts of providers that are there on the market. These, for one reason or another, are just doing what they want. So when we talk about this service provision, it's not necessarily and largely not so that we are getting good quality services from there. So the regulatory capacity, the stewardship capacity, the accountability capacity, standard setting capacity of the government is extremely low. It is only concentrated on these 30% of the service provision. It is not setting it is not penetrating there, and it's a very myopic view which we are having. So I think that has to break. There are ideological differences which need to be addressed, but there is no other way other than setting joint objectives, taking interests into stakeholders into consideration, and making policies and objectives to which all equally commit with some incentives and with some obligations to deliver on those objectives. Just a quick point about <clears throat> political will. I completely agree. But sometimes announcements by prime ministers, um, what happens is that people just take the announcement at face value and just scamper around to put something on top. And that is dangerous. Uh, I think something like that happened already. Uh, so uh, while I agree that that is political will, there is also a lot of bureaucratic will. Um, that is not there. That's not there. And, and um, uh, politics is different from bureaucracy. And I think uh, partly the reason why we haven't been able to move forward is that the administration hasn't really focused on it uh, the way it should have. Thank you, Indrani. Um, just another question, because I was, I mean, surprised, for, I mean, surprised and happily, um, positively surprised. I've been taking notes of what you have said, and you have said that there is a coincidence that there was a clear understanding that research had to be behind this. You cannot improvise. This is a very serious trip, number one. Number two, 
there were some swift shifts from this king to this, or the post-Tsar period, and then the funding from the public purse was another thing present, and so on. But what I found interesting is that the political will that in the West we could have said that came from economic progress, it was kind of a, took decades and little by little the authorities were saying, oh, well, I better give something more. In the two countries, or three countries that we have analyzed, have been having different origins. In one case, it was the important point of avoiding instability. In other countries, it was like uh, providing some sense of cohesive, whatever. And in other words, an explicit message of social justice. So this brings me back to the issue of, of ideology. And sometimes we see that the whole development of universal health coverage is dressed with, uh, with a substantial amount of ideology. So my question to the members of the panel, to, to all of you, is to say, in a few weeks, India is going to have a new government because of the, of the elections are finishing. If you had one bullet, one conversation with the prime minister and the government, what would you tell them not to do? <laughs> what is, because the positive things have been expressed, but what is, in your opinion, the worst mistake that they could make in a situation like this after having had the country in titters for three years waiting for, some, for the kingdom to come and it never came? What would you tell them to do? I mean, obviously, not to. <laughs> Negatively. Wow, a lot of, lot of time to think about it. Um, these elevator questions, right? Yeah, yeah, I know. What would I tell whoever is in the Prime, prime Minister's office? No? Anybody. Whoever. Anybody, okay. Um, don't start with a scattered approach. Start with the vision and then do it and, and work it through, right? So don't, don't start for the te first 20 years with a certain group, which is then the affluent group, but look at the entire population group, and evidence shows that it's doable, feasible, and effective. Vivian. Again, if I were to say, take the China example, I would say, or really, actually any example, because I can see Australia at the moment, the cube is becoming a little bit like a Swiss cheese, but um, I would say, don't leave it to the marketplace because trickle down does not happen. And if you want to use the private sector, you need to have extremely good regulatory framework, good governance framework, and be very clear where you're trying to go. Otherwise, the inequalities will simply increase. Don't listen to those who have the loudest voice in, in the health sector it's about health care it's not health business so don't listen to the pharma industry don't listen to the medical association access to medicines and unregulated private sector are probably the two most the biggest problems we have in india today thank you please don't start by undoing what your predecessor have done, <laughs> just for the sake of undoing that. I think that's very important. good. Build on that, Lisa. I'm going to answer this by way of an anecdote. Um, in Uganda, uh, when President Museveni decided that he needed to get elected, um, you may know the story that he reached out to people all across his country and said, you know. <laughs> Oh, what would get me reelected? What would you vote for? And people all across Uganda said, get rid of user fees for education. Let our kids go to school for free. Museveni wins two elections on that. He's up for his third election, <laughs> and he reaches out to the population, and he says, you know, oh, what would you guys vote for me on? And people all across Uganda said, get rid of health fees. Abolish them. And as you probably know, he does and uh, he wins two more elections. He was having a discussion with uh, a group of what were called the New African Leaders. These were the presidents of Rwanda, South Sudan, uh, Ethiopia. <laughs> uh, 
Eritrea, Kenya. He was having a discussion with them, and they were all saying, you know, you keep winning elections. You know, wow, that's incredible. How are you doing that? And Museveni says, well, you know, I've abolished fees, which is a very popular thing to do. And the story goes that Paul Kagame, one of the great presidents, you know, Rwanda, Paul Kagame says, but, but how did you manage that? And Museveni says, I didn't listen to the experts because every one of them told me this wasn't possible. Thank you. <laughs> Indrani. <laughs> Indrani. Uh, well, I would just tell the government to take one year to plan for universal health coverage and figure out how it might want to bridge the infrastructure, personnel, health financing gaps first, and then think about uh, universal health coverage. Good. Thank you. And the final question, because we would like you to make your own questions. The final question to the panel in an environment like this cannot but address the issue of multi-agencies and collaboration and, and the experts that Lisa was referring to. Um, sometimes one feels that for the sake of getting differentiated, the nuances are bizarre and so on. What would be your suggestion in order to align everybody behind the essences of these in a pragmatic, effective, consistent, and robust way. What would you tell the community of international donors and agencies and so on, the experts, for them to do? I think that's, um, I think the, the message really is to align ourselves to national policies, and that's where we should focus on. Um, so, so long as, as it, the national policies and national policy makers take in Rani Di's advice, do have a national agenda, and we can align ourselves on that. In fact, I feel that that um, certainly with, with the World Bank too, looking at UHC in a similar way and in forums like this, we do find a lot of alignment in the thinking among development partners. It's really bridging that gap now between what's happening in countries and, and the push that, that the development partners want to make. And I think it's important for us to remember that UHC is, is um, it, most countries are phasing it in. So that's where we need to align ourselves in terms of national policies and plans. Thank you, Lynn. I, I would agree. Lee, sorry. <laughs> I certainly think that when the development partners um, speak with a coherent voice, then it really is very, very helpful for accelerating movement forward. But I think a really important part of that is always checking that we are really talking about making a difference to the daily lives of people on the ground. And that's the ultimate test. Thank you. Rudiger. <clears throat> yeah, first of all, Lisa, I just wanted to check with you. Um, was it the experts or was it the interest groups? that he didn't want to listen to. Is there any difference? Uh, I think the point that President Museveni was raising, if I understand well, was that, in fact, he was told, and I hope this isn't taken the wrong way, by um, a relevant international organization that was a specialist in health, that he fiscally couldn't abolish fees and keep the system going in Uganda. He was told that. And he just said, I'm sorry, I'm a politician, I gotta get elected. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not gonna listen to you. Right. I'm gonna do it. And he does abolish fees, and of course, for 15 years, the Ugandan health system stands on its feet. Now, it's in trouble now, we know that, for a different set of reasons. Right. So I, th I think the point that he was raising, and it, it, it's a way of underlining comments that, that all of our, our colleagues have put on the table today, is he made it a political priority. And he stood up and he insisted that all of the government systems work to that political priority, even when the experts said, don't do it. Yeah, that, that brings me to two points. Number one, it's that the responsibility we have in the international community, we need to be much more alert to what is feasible and what is not, right? So the point that Vivian was making to really align the both the donor community but also the UN organizations around the different options that you have politically 
I think that's extremely important and that we're doing our homework. If we have differences of opinion between the World Bank and WHO on feasibility or non-feasibility of fiscal space, uh, these are discussions that we need to have amongst ourselves and there's differences of schools and opi of opinions for sure, but we need to sort out our homework before we're presenting these different options to the countries and therefore I, I, I think that Vivian, you were absolutely right in, in being coherent about what we're saying. Now there's a, another issues, issue in health. Health is the biggest economic driver in the world. The biggest economic driver. We're spending 6.5 trillion US dollars per year on health, right? And that is increasing by huge percentage levels. Only four years ago, we were spending 5.9 trillion US dollars. So this is highly on the increase, and that has to do with emerging economies, but it has to do also with increasing costs, which are actually triggered outside of the health sector. Right? So a lot of ill health is produced, of course, by decisions outside of the health sector. So we need to be uh, much more coherent and alert to what sort of decisions are the healthier ones and what are the unhealthier ones. And so therefore, you know, this is something, the coherence um, in the UN system is extremely important. And um, also because um, I would say that we don't have um, an economic interest in our expertise. We have perhaps an academic interest, but not an economic one, which is different than to other um, uh, voices, usually ministries of health are listening to. Thank you. Let me, let me go to Indran in, in, in order to link with what Rudiger has said. Because if I understand correctly what has been said, and, and he was explicitly agreeing with you, you say, take yourself a year and cross this desert. Because it's going to be difficult. You have to be making numbers and, and people will be drumming the thing outside and say, hold, hold, hold. And how will you envisage this process of crossing one year desert while the agencies are discussing, what kind of process comes to your mind now that you've seen a lot of seminars and workshops and festivals, so to speak, in a, in a way, without much tangible drive? How will you see that, please? Well, um, <clears throat> if I understand your question correctly, first of all, I would also like to say what I see the donors or the development agencies doing in the meantime. I think if they all agree, as Vivian pointed out, that I think one thing that we've all agreed on in this room, probably, at least, uh, is that we need to hit the pause button in India a bit and uh, step back and do the homework, as you said. And the development partners can help India do the homework, not because it doesn't have the technical capacity, but just urging the country to do the homework. So um, that's one part of it, and the other is it's it's really not rocket science, as uh, Nata pointed out. Uh, it's it's fairly simple to hunker down and figure out all the costs and the finances and the consolidation and the, uh, the pooling, etc. It's just that it needs time. It needs good research. It needs good technical capacity, and India has all of that. Uh, so I think that's we just see ourselves um, putting our heads down and doing some homework. Very good. Nata, please. Um, I would see that the government accepts, first of all, opens doors for all the stakeholders who have to be involved in the process of vision formulation and the detailed roadmap formulation, and very importantly, in formulation of micro plans, because this is one big success determinant which has worked for polio because there were not just visions and uh, you know ideas and uh, ambitions there were very concrete translation into the micro plan and in micro plan it was time bound finance bound action bound accountability framework was there so everybody knew who what the other is doing notwithstanding that there were many partners donors state and union and um, you know, communities involved and everybody. So, because there was a 
a very serious approach to micro planning. So that needs to be planned after the visions and everything gets done. The other thing I think what is necessary is to accept legitimate interests of other stakeholders, including private sector, including pharmaceutical industry, uh, who does have right to make a profit. The question is, how do you address the legitimate interests of indispensable players in the agenda of India by bringing them on the, around the table and discussing with them and accommodating in a reasonable, balanced manner their interest within the greater national interests of public health. And uh, perhaps thirdly, have the guts to deal with corruption. Because a lot of those things which are not happening or happening, etc., are because of very serious issue of corruption in health sector, in other sectors, in everywhere. So if the new government that comes does not take this to, to its heart and doesn't see the interests of this nation above individual interests of policymakers, I don't think India can progress very fast on this agenda. It will progress anyway because the justice cannot be stopped. It cannot be stopped. It can be delayed, it can be uh, downplayed, it can be suppressed, but it will come out sooner or later. So if the government is smart, it will take it seriously and say, what is it that we can do to bring this country to where it belongs? Thank you. Lisa, your turf. So in, how do you run this process for one year? In, 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 yeah, those of us who have been knocking around the development world for a while will remember swaps, right? Sector-wide approaches. This was the um, answer to the question that, that you raised, Doctor. How are we all going to coordinate ourselves against national priorities? And of course, what we were supposed to do as the international community was come up with a sector-wide approach that was based on the priorities and policies of the national government, and we were all supposed to align our monies and our work with them. And of course, this didn't work. And I think the question is, did it not work because of the particular moment in the history of international cooperation that swaps were introduced? Or did it not work because it just doesn't make sense to have lots and lots of different players with lots and lots of different interests all trying to collaborate vaguely on a set of vague goals? It doesn't make sense. And I think that we really have to ask ourselves as the international community whether or not the role that we play, and some panels have, panelists have suggested this, whether the role we play is in fact as constructive as we pretend it to be and tell ourselves it is, or whether we have to recognize that in many ways we're pulling in precisely the wrong kind of direction. Well, it can be told louder, but it cannot be told clearer. <laughs> so with your permission, we are very much uh, near the end, but I would like to ask your permission and the to have a, a round of uh, questions from the audience before we close. Something like take um, five, two, five, four, four. okay. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, five questions. That's the first Yeah, one. good evening everyone. I, uh, my name is Dr. Nikhil. I'm working in Ministry of Health as consultant. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank the panel for their pragmatic views on advancing UHC in India. And I have very specific two questions. Uh, I would like to refer to Dr. Neta's presentation's first slide, where Adam Wagstaff has said that it is UHC is old wine in new bottle. So I would like to ask the panel whether the panel agrees with Adam, and if it agrees, why? Uh, my second question is: uh, We all agree that uh, private sector has a important role to play in uh, UHC. Uh, but what should be the role of private sector uh, with particular the context of 12th fire plan which says that public health system will be the main service delivery sector and private will just fill the gaps. So I would like to ask the panel whether private sector should play the role of gap filling or it should play a role of competitor to the public health sector. Thank you. Okay, let's go. Who wants to answer the which question? I can answer some of it and maybe. Yes. Okay. The five, it will be, it will be too much. The second one was this lady here. 
about like where India can learn, and as Alka has pointed, that Thailand is a good example, and another example is I think Costa Rica. So where they have merged all the small schemes and then they made a single pool. Um, but uh, of course in India, like we have this RSBY, which is the biggest scheme and which is being run by Ministry of Labor, which is outside Ministry of Health. So there's kind of like an issue there, you know, whether, you know, it's one single government body should be running schemes or like should it be multiple. So I think uh, there's an issue to be resolved there. Um, secondly, I think, um, as we said, the states, you know, have been asked to now roll out all these, uh, you know, their own models of universal health coverage. I think that's not the way to go forward because states do not have the capacity to not only plan but also implement and also monitor, you know, what kind of universal health, health coverage to do. They don't have the capacity to even design, you know, what to purchase and whom, from where to purchase. Um, so therefore, we have to have a national body, like you know, within the Ministry of Health, you know, which can kind of plan for Pan India, like you know, despite the differences among states, I think there are common issues across the states. So a national body has to be constituted. For example, in Thailand, they have a purchasing body outside the Ministry of Health, and we don't have something uh, similar within India. So I think we have to have a, a body which can plan, which can do research, and also kind of you know do purchasing on behalf of the Ministry of Health. And also when it comes to purchasing, I think there are two sectors, the public sector and the private sector. Um, so in the public sector, we have this, uh, you know, the money which is coming to government doctors in the form of salaries. So you have to switch from salaries now to kind of performance-based system or capitation system as Thailand has done. And also in private sector, I think there's a problem of unregulated private sector. So how do you kind of bring in private sector resources to, to pay for the universal health coverage? So these are the issues we have to uh, tackle with it. Another important thing is we don't have capacity to monitor, you know, the government doesn't have the capacity to monitor universal health coverage. There's a need to build up even that when you're financing, when you're purchasing. Uh, so how do we monitor? So that I think capacity has to be built in before we start rolling out USC. Thanks. Please identify yourself. Yeah, my name is uh, Patrulekha Chatterjee. I'm an independent journalist writing on public health and uh, a whole range of development issues. So I, one of the things I picked up from uh, listening to all the, the panelists is the, the importance of political will, uh, very, very critical to advancing the UHC, and especially the examples which were given, and you know, I and my also writings have been focusing on Thailand and China, also Sri Lanka. So I'm just trying to understand this. So what is this, you know, what, like you also mentioned about Museveni and Uganda. So. In our, this time during the elections, we had two political parties, including the ruling one, which actually had a system of right to health. They put it in their manifestos, but it wasn't talked about in the campaign trail. So what is it, why is it that in some countries it becomes, you know, it becomes a political issue, but say in India, even though, uh, you, you know, why doesn't it become a political, I mean, it's something which I've been trying to, you know, figure out, and I was just wondering if there's any thoughts on that. I'm going to ask the panel to respond to these because there are a number of issues. There was a mention of the old wine, a mention of the role of the private sector, the multiplicity of schemes, the capacity existing in India for purchasing and monitoring, and therefore the need of a specialized body, the possibility to shift to a performance-based payment method, and then the very important but very difficult question of why in India the manifestos do not get expressed in the political uh, sphere in reality. And then we will continue with the second round, and that should be. Thank you. Any volunteers here? Um, just pretty quickly, I would say that um, mm. it's about the cuvee rather than old and new wine and bottles. Um, because if you look at the, con the constitution of the WHO, those ideals are embodied in UHC. If you look at the de Declaration of Ata, that takes a little bit further. UHC, the Commission on Social Determinants, these are all progressive um, movements forward, drawing on the lessons and, and pointing the way um, in ever more detailed way. So it's a coup. Um, and I think in relation to the private sector, for me, it's about the clarity why would you want to compete? What are you trying to achieve with that? When is competition a good thing? When is competition a dangerous thing? 
So having very clear ideas about the tools and the objectives, I think is the important issue. Just as this question of single versus multiple bodies and schemes, I mean, I've worked in federalist systems and having clarity about roles and functions is very, very important um, in terms of how do you actually make sure that you're working efficiently and drawing on the best possible. Um, and I think on this issue about political will and when things become political issue, I think this is a very interesting thing where you, when you start to look at countries, sometimes political will is completely reactive. You've got a crisis, you respond. But other times it can be actually a very sophisticated political analysis that leads you to certain types of policies and actions. So I think this really becomes also a question about the political wisdom that may be there. Um, I think it is old wine in a new bottle and it isn't because universal health coverage is different from even what the primary health care concept was, from what the health for all concept was. In fact, it was new to health community because it didn't include coverage by quality services and access to those services, but it included also financial protection. This has not been part of our discussion, so it has never been together. Separately, yes, we were talking about economics, but bringing together explicit goal of financial protection, it has been very, very new in my view. It has been also news for health economists who have actually been dealing with economics of insurance schemes mostly, but not so much with economics of the universal coverage. So I think the way it was configured, the way the universality was put forward, the way it was um, shaped up in the WHO's 2010 report, it is still a lot of news which is coming there and it requires different response from the one that we have introduced in the Amata declaration response 30 years back, which has not succeeded, by the way. So there is a lot of differences of how you do it, what kind of arrangements you have to put in place, and how you implement that. Now, role of private sector in delivering on uh, universal health coverage, especially in India, should be uh, and will be greater than it may be in some other societies just because of historical reality of available of those service providers. So the question is that even within private sector, we have extraordinary variation of the, in terms of quality, in terms of standards, in terms of cost of uh, uh, procedure and so on. So there is a lot of things which need to be aligned and consensus need to be reached and real price tags should be put on procedures if they are to be involved in provision of universal health coverage services. But otherwise, without them, especially in urban India, we are not going to succeed. So we have to be very well aware of that. Uh, political will is, of course, a very complex issue. It's not that they don't have political will. I think every politician would like to do something for health of its people and succeed on that. The question is that political will requires very serious negotiations, capacity to negotiate with the interests of stakeholders, but also to do the right things. And right things are never easy to do. And many times those who have done right things have been uh, victims or have been sacrificed together with the right things uh, along. So it does require some different political guts and, and willingness to put your interest at stake of success or failure. So that is that is why, and because India has such a complex landscape of political reality, federal, state, this, that, parties, I mean, democracy also takes its toll in these particular circumstances. So I think it, has, it does require national consensus on some of those core issues before we can talk about individual politicians expressing their will. Uh, capacity for purchasing, of course, this is uh, some, it's a technical capacity which needs to be put in place. India has just put in place procurement agency for uh, medicines and vaccines and whatever, and even that one is going to take years before it is going to be fully functional. But what we have heard in yesterday in the meeting which I was attending on HIV AIDS, that 
Indian produced drugs, HIV products especially, that are exported all over the world and correspond to 89% of global consumption of antiretroviral medicines all over, are sold for a higher price in India by Indian manufacturers as compared to price tag they put when they export these drugs to um, Africa, for example. Now, that is not acceptable. That should not be allowed, and there should be a mechanism to oversee that and to take action not to allow this to happen. Indian poor 500 million cannot be put in a situation when they have to subsidize the rest of the world. So I think these are issues which are to, to be brought on the surface and addressed really. And um, yeah, I think I'll stop here. Um, thank you. Just to reiterate what WR said, the private sector in India is actually not filling a gap. It's the dominant provider of services. So it's, it's not really a gap that they're filling. And um, um, I, the other thing is it doesn't have to be competition. It, it needs to be a partnership um, where the, the, the public sector, the government, is directing through regulation. And I think, uh, as we've already discussed, it's not a question of, of uh, an open market, but really regulated contribution of the private sector. Um, let's be, uh, in terms of the political will, I mean, let's be frank as well. When Thaksin in Thailand uh, uh, fought the elections in 2001 on the UHC ticket, it was a strategic move. Thailand had already achieved about 70% coverage in all three dimensions, uh, population, um, service, as well as a level of subsidy. So he, they, Thailand was very close to universal health coverage. However, it was increasing um, inequities, access to health. So it was a very strategic choice. Um, the will was very strong um, because there was that commitment to equity, but it was a strategic choice. So I think in the case of India, it seems to be on the back burner. It's also one of the issues. And, and just to link up to what Indranidhi said, perhaps it's because of a lack of... Um, I won't say understanding, the evidence that, it's, that health contributes so much to inequity and poverty. Perhaps there isn't that kind of recognition, and there isn't that kind of recognition. There, there are quick wins to resolve this, which again, for which, again, we need strong evidence. I mean, it's, it's, the evidence is there, but it's really internalizing by the political parties. I'm going to say something quickly about political will in the context of, of England, where I grew up. You know, the first time that the British state becomes very much involved in public health is when the recruits for the Crimea War were so malnourished that Britain was having a hard time making up the numbers for the brigades it needed to fight that war against Russia. And this is when you see suddenly the British state become actively involved in starting to regulate public health. Who was the political will on that part? Who was exhibiting it? It was the Defense Department that said, if our recruits aren't healthy enough, we're going to lose this war. In Britain, after World War II, after the working class went and fought against the fascists to free Europe from the scourge, they came back to Britain and they said to the state, you must ensure our health. We demand it. And because of the might of the working class after that war, Britain had one of the best public health care systems. That's an example of two very different kinds of political will, both exhibited through the military who would have Right. Um, yeah. Um, now, just on the political interests, usually uh, my understanding is they increase with money which is involved in that. And um, so, uh, first of all, perhaps on, on the SWATs, therefore, I don't know, in India, it takes 1% of GDP, the development enterprise industry, not even a, a percent, uh, whereas um, uh, health globally, as I said, is, is the biggest donor, so um, driver. Now, we know in, in WHO quite a bit about political interests, but the thing is, you can still, you can be of different, you can actually portray different political interests, but you should do this in a coherent way. So that's the rules of the game, rather than, I think, trying to be all uh, aligned and friends and whatever, that would be naive. Let's not be naive about health. Now, the, the question about the private sector and uh, 
um, uh, then RSBY, thank you very much for that intervention also. I think the private sector unregulated is the problem. You need to regulate what, you, and, and that's a state, that's a state uh, task. You need to regulate what you want the private sector to do. What I would totally advise against is to have an unregulated private sector on the one side and then an attempt to create a health system for the poor which will ultimately be a poor system because you, you're lacking the solidarity mechanisms that we were talking about before that the rich pay for the poor, the healthy for the unhealthy and the young for the old. That is what you need to drive any system and whatever um, financing mode you have, contribution-based, tax-based, whatever, is then you know, a matter of economic interests or political interests, what you have. Indrani. Clear. Um, about the political will, I think we don't have enough advocates in the country. And that's partly our fault as well. We haven't been able to uh, you know, broadcast the message very well, the researchers. But at the same time, I think uh, unlike the education and the uh, you know, food uh, security bill, etc., why didn't this happen uh, for, uh, in the country? I think partly the answer is that we have lived with, I'm a little cynical about it, we've lived with a lot of inequity for a long time in the country and we got used to it. And um, though people who make the policies are not affected by lack of uh, UHC. Uh, and the dependence on private sector is quite complete there because the government has in its own health coverage access to private sector. It has driven up the cost because CJHS and others can actually go to the private sector and get reimbursed with the government. So you can't double speak all the time. You can't depend on an iniquitous system and then talk about UHC. So I, I think there is a lot of, uh, the lack of political will is coming a little bit from there as well. Because, you know, people who are going to change the policies are also going to be affected with the, uh, with the new setup. I, I will just talk about the m and &E. I think it's absolutely important that we, in that one year, set up the m and &E system as well. Because we can't do without the m and &E, you know, otherwise we can't do course correction. Um, yes, RSPY, there's a lot of controversy around RSPY. It's not supposedly the best system that India has. So the government has to take a decision as to how, what it does with these schemes. It has already floated so many schemes, and what does it do? So that's the other year, you know, one year it has to think about it. And in NFS, has been said about the private sector, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, I would really like to honor the promise that I will take two more words from the first round, and then we'll close because it's getting late. Please. Uh, I'm Charu Kirk, and uh, I'm just moved back to India after spending 15 years abroad, and I'm really excited to be creating some of the knowledge products and work on the research and evidence uh, here. I think my primary question to the panel would be, uh, we have talked about service delivery, we talk about financing, we talk about population, the three arms, but the population, do we need to focus on specific aspects or do we focus on everything? I think Nata did mention in her thing that we will have to be incremental. Just did some work, uh, 320 million informal sector workers are not covered with anything, RSBY, government programs, nothing they are covered with. They are in the second and the third income quintiles. They are, they are the ones who face the catastrophic expenditures and go below the poverty line. So we need to think of populations. Populations who are economically backward, populations who are occupationally backward, let me call it if it's, that's the right word to use, populations uh, which have some particular disease aspects. So I think we'll need to focus our, uh, like, you know, if the panel agrees, that should be the line of focus for the country to look at, and then look at what are the service delivery mechanisms and the financing mechanisms that need to be put in place for them. The second point I just want to mention to Lisa regarding the right to information. We have a very strong act on that. I believe that. But what about the access to information? I talk to people who are working for us. They don't know about RSBY. Even if you tell them, they cannot go and get that RSBY scheme uh, enrolled themselves. So where is that? The way of getting covered, even if you have schemes or even if you have a fragmented system, we have no way that we can cover this population. Thank you so much. Yeah, Dr. Sarjit Dudeja. In India, when we talk of health, it's based on nutrition and water. 
and when we say indian food that is a food in medicine and medicine food when we take proper food indian there is no need for a medicine it's perfect food so we should take care of only water and food in proper shape no i'm sorry no i'd, I'd just like the panel to respond to this and i think we're getting um, just very quickly, I think the, the issue that Charu raised, it's not about schemes. And this is why UHC is important, because it's talking about delivery of um, uh, delivery through uh, government mechanisms that is available to everybody, regardless of what whether they're enrolled in a scheme or not. It's not about schemes. Um, in relation to you, prevention and promotion is very important, and that's, that's certainly the balance we want to achieve. I'm not sure all Indian food, but... Um, Certainly. The Alika that we are not going to take a schemes approach. And I actually, I think it's a good point that you raised. Water, sanitation, hygiene, we've always been ignoring those in our uh, health planning. Uh, I think it's about time we brought those things back. First of all, thank you very much for raising social determinants um, of health. Thank you very much for that. Indeed, that is responsible for the magnitude of, of good health. So let's go back to that. And, and to you, um, universal health coverage is for everybody. But then there needs to be a certain assistance, a much more assistance to those people who do not know, who do not, um, who cannot write, who, who, who cannot read. They need to be assisted. And that is something then a duty, I think. And there is some, some very good projects actually going on in India, which are now on the upscale. I was, as you have heard, I was living here and had the privilege of living here in rural Karnataka for a while. And, and there we established those facilitation centers that people would go to and then get the assistance and then aid to get their claims through and get the money later on. That's, I think, then the special attention you need to to, to, to place on those people. Thank you. I'm very sorry that I cannot take more words, but we are 25 minutes, I mean, beyond the schedule. I think it has been a, a pleasure and a privilege for me to share this time with this distinguished panel and with this distinguished audience, and I've learned a lot, and I would really like you to please give a round of applause to this fantastic panel. And uh, to close this, there was supposed to be a reception at the loans, but there's a storm. So please go to the reception area, and, and that's where we're going to meet. Thank you very much.